Hello everybody, my name is John Mark Johnson Jr. I'm the host of Reform GGA and today I have a new gun to review. But before I get into that review, I wanted to give a shout out to a company called Quiet Riot Firearms. You see this gun that I'm going to review broke in the test uh, in the process of testing it and in looking for a spare part I really couldn't find any anywhere online it was an extractor that I was looking for however quiet riot firearms had a complete bolt assembly for sale in the proper caliber 762 by 39 and at least they they said that they had one in stock and so I bought that from them and they emailed me a few days later saying, hey, um, we said this was in stock, but it turns out it wasn't in stock. We have this other product that is very similar, except it's nickel boron coated. It's still a 762 by 39 bolts. Um, same basic idea, but it's nickel boron coated. Will you take that instead at no additional upcharge? And I'm sitting there going, yeah, sure. Uh, it's a part that'll work for me and you're giving me a better product for the same price. I will definitely do that. Thank you very much. And let them know that I was appreciative of them making the situation right and not charging me any additional for the stocking mistake on their end. And overall, I've been very impressed with them. The, basically the same day that they noticed the problem, they emailed me, I emailed them back, and that same day they had the alternative nickel boron uh, bolt sent out to me. Awesome people to work for, definitely stand behind their work. Uh, do right by the customer, and I would suggest that if you get on their website and you see anything there, uh, that you happen to need that you buy from them. They're a good uh, good stand-up group of guys. With that out of the way, let's go ahead and get into the gun. The gun that I got, I got for a very specific reason, and that is that I wanted something that could fit inside of this case right here. This is my traveling gun case. It is an 18-inch uh, pistol case, technically. And uh, what is the brand name on this? It is a Vital Impact case. I use this case because when I put padlocks on the front, I don't have them on there right now, but when I put padlocks on the front, this thing will usually, depends on the TSA agent, but it usually passes uh, TSA inspection as being uh, adequately secure for carrying firearms. And I can put this in my general travel suitcase. It's not out in the open for everybody to see. It still needs TSA inspection. It's good to go. And this is basically what I have to work with. Um, this is all the all the space that I have for guns. And so I needed something that could fit in here. And I wanted to upgrade from the gun that I've been carrying for quite a while. And I was able to do that. Let me go ahead and show you what it looks like now. See if I can get it in frame well enough. It looks like just a bunch of parts and that's okay, but what is in there? You'll see what would be uh, my top left. I think it's going to be your top right perhaps, depending on how the, the video shoots. But over there in the corner you see the, the handgun, that's a CZ P10, and then the rest of the parts in the lower part of the case are a KS47 10.5 inch, and it all fits in this 18 inch case quite well. And so it works as a traveling gun. And this is definitely an upgrade from my previous traveling gun. Now my previous traveling gun is what I would call a traveling bedside gun. Oops, dropped a couple of rounds here. Traveling bedside gun. And previously it was this thing right here. This is a CZ Scorpion Evo 3 S1 pistol with a 7 and like 0 0.72 inch barrel or something like that, almost an 8 inch barrel, and it has a folding SB brace. This is what I used as my traveling bedside gun for quite a long time because it's relatively lightweight, being mostly polymer. The bolt inside, of course, adds quite a bit of weight, but overall, still fairly light, um, very compact. It very easily fits in the case that I just uh, showed you because uh, the brace is a folding brace and also pretty reliable uh, and those kinds of things. However, I would not call it a multi-roll gun. It works adequately as a bedside gun, but for other roles that you might have, like say, if you get stranded somewhere out there and I will sometimes be well more than a thousand miles away from home. If you get stranded somewhere and you happen to need food, well, 9mm is an adequate 
self-defense round, and it can even be an adequate hunting round, but it's far from ideal. Doable, yes. Ideal, not so much. Uh, and so I've been thinking about upgrading, and this has been a progressive thing with me. You guys who follow my stuff over the years know that I've kind of progressed and maybe regressed to a certain extent on what I wanted for a traveling bedside gun. At one time, it was the uh, the kel uh, CMR30 22 Magnum, and the reason why I did it is because at the time I had a larger case, and so I could fit the a larger gun and with it rounds capacity was absolutely huge and very lightweight not all that reliable unfortunately but lightweight could carry a lot of ammunition um, then i went to the full size cz scorpion carbine the one with the 16 inch barrel and again when i had the larger case that worked just fine had to go to a smaller case and so i tried out the uh the Strebog sp9a1 for a little while and I was not overly impressed with that gun, especially in terms of its magazines. Its magazines were a major failure. And then when they started messing with the system and they changed some of the internals from the dual recoil rod assembly to single recoil rod assembly. And then with the A3 version that was supposed to be a delayed, uh, roller delayed kind of system. Uh, just wasn't overall that impressed with it, especially in terms of being able to take a wide variety of ammunition. And that one wound up going away, and I basically went back to the CZ Scorpion just in uh, pistol configuration. And it has served me really well. I've been very happy with uh, this gun. It has been totally adequate to the job. Just unfortunately, with it being a 9mm, it's a little expensive to shoot right now. Almost every cartridge is expensive to shoot right now, but 9mm especially. And on top of that, um, it is uh, not the most effective cartridge out there. And to me, one of my requirements for all of my guns is that it has to be, you know, reasonable, plink worthy. That's hard to do now with the price of ammunition of all, every kind of ammunition. But 9mm is really not a plinking round for me anymore. And so I can't really go out and shoot it recreationally. And aside from the bedside, you know, traveling bedside rule, it's really not that useful of a gun. You know, it's not something that you can really hunt with. I mean, you could, but you're going to be limited on what you can do with it, and you're going to have to be very careful in what you do with it, so on and so forth. It's just really not ideal for a lot of things. And so, times necessitate change, because times change, and so I wound up with the uh, KS-47 that you saw in the uh, pistol case. And I'll go ahead and we'll take it out piece by piece and just kind of look it over. And the first piece here is the SBA-3 pistol brace. Lots of guns, whether they be AR type guns or even um, some of the AKs with AR adapters on them and whatnot. Lots of pistols are coming with these SBA-3 brace right, and braces right now. And the reason for that is because they are very adequate to the task. They are not stocks. The, the bottom part is way too flimsy to function as a normal stock. And they're not meant to be a normal stock. They're meant to be a brace that you wrap around your arm kind of thing. And uh, the ATF has also said that sternum resting them is perfectly fine as well. Although I will say that pretty much every brace that is out there, whether it be the SBA-3 or... Um, the one that's on the, the CZ Scorpion or any of those, they do not tend to be all that well designed for sternum resting, which is annoying to me because the ATF does say that is a perfectly okay way to use a brace. It would make more sense for me to, for them to actually design it to be useful that way. If the ATF says it's okay, go ahead and design it to that, but yeah. Yeah, it is what it is. Uh, but with that being said, it is still very good. It is adjustable, has the adjustment level on there. And you'll also notice that it does have quick de and detached sling mount points. Uh, this is my own sling mount that it came with, but it comes with uh, the whole insert so that you can put your quick detach on it. And uh, they're also relatively lightweight. Let me see if we can get some kind of a, a scale here. I don't have a proper scale, so I just use a fishing scale. But yeah, this thing is incredibly lightweight. It comes in at only about a half a pound. So there's not much weight there at all. And if you're trying to save on weight, that is definitely a bonus. 
uh, have a couple of guns with these on them now, and I've been very happy with them. I was hoping to get this one in FDE, but at the time they just didn't have it available. There's lots of things that are not available right now, unfortunately, but it is where it is. All right, and then that, of course, goes on the KS-47 lower. I'll go ahead and put the hammer back down here. And it's a very typical AR uh, sort of lower uh, with a few obvious changes. One thing that I will notice right off the, the bat is that I did go ahead and upgrade the grip. Uh, this is the Mo Plus grip that Magpul puts out. It's uh, a rubberized uh, grip. And I do like it in terms of the grip that it offers. I definitely like it over the, uh, the stock A2 grip that this one came with, which is just awful. I hate the A2 grip. It has that little finger groove on it, and it's hard plastic, and you start manipulating it, and that little finger groove will really start rubbing on you, and it's very unpleasant. This is much more pleasant than that. I will say, though, that I don't like the rubber ones as much as the plastic ones. The plastic ones don't have a super great grip texture, but it is texture dependent, uh, which means that uh, the condition of the grip can change in terms of being wet or dusty or mud or whatever, and it will still provide you with some kind of a grip because it has a stipple texture to it that does most of the job of providing the grip. These rubber ones, while they're dry, excellent grip, but if they get wet or muddy or maybe you get some gun oil on them, then they can become really slick, and that's the one thing that I would say I don't like about this Mo Plus grip. It's while, when it's dry, it's wonderful. When it's wet or oily or muddy or whatever, not so much, but that's maybe a personal preference. And then in terms of other things that kind of annoy me about it, the, the grip was my choice. I had decided to put the Mo Plus grip on it just because it is a very comfortable grip when it's dry. But another issue is uh, the trigger guard. This trigger guard is exceptionally wide, and when I go to grip it, uh, my second finger really rubs on the edge, and it's a very hard angular edge. It's not beveled at, pretty much at all. I mean, there's a little bit of a bevel there, enough to keep you from cutting yourself, but it is still a very abrupt edge, and after a while with shooting with it, that, that can really get to you and start kind of rubbing you the wrong way, as it were. And so there's a part of me that's very tempted to just take a, a file and round out that edge a little bit, but it is definitely too wide of a trigger guard in my opinion. All right, coming forward from that, you do have a paddle type release and you can be activated with your index finger. My index fingers are a little on the short side and this one does seem to have quite a bit of resistance, especially once you got a magazine in there. And so I don't find it all that useful to do that. Uh, but you can, of course, grip it from the bottom and do a uh, kind of a, a normal AK type release. And then the magwell itself, as you can see, is pretty bare, and it's because it takes AK magazines. We'll go ahead and show one of those. All right, so empty AK magazine, and it just rocks and locks in place. And then basically normal AK release if you want to go that way. If your fingers are long enough and you can get a, enough purchase, you can also release with your index finger from the side. Uh, it's not bad, and one of the things that I do like about this Magwell is that it does have metal inserts into it. It is a um, aluminum uh, type of frame, as most AR designs are. This is basically an AR-15 size that's been modified to take AK magazines. Uh, so I do like that they put in the uh, the steel reinforcements, but the steel reinforcements aren't as useful as they would be. The idea was if you get steel AK magazines, these aren't, these are just the, uh, the Magpul uh, Generation 1 uh, magazines. I also have some of the Generation 3 that have the, uh, the steel inserts on them. Um, the idea was that if you're using a steel magazine, uh, you want steel tabs in there to keep it from wearing down on the aluminum, which makes sense. The problem, though, is that the way that this is arranged, it still allows uh, the magazine to, to wobble a little bit. Now, they did wind up fixing that wobble problem, the fact that the, uh, the magazine can come up a little too high, and I'll show you that fix on the upper. They just put a couple of over-insertion tabs in there. Unfortunately, though, the over-insertion tabs that they picked are aluminum, 
because they basically just made it out of uh, the, the block uh, that the whole housing is made out of. And so it's aluminum over insertion tabs. And so those can wear a little bit if you're talking about a, a steel magazine. So my personal recommendation, even though they have those steel inserts in there, is that if you can, you really do want to stick with polymer type magazines with this gun, just because those over insertion tabs are not steel. Uh, I like that the, the tabs down here are all steel. That works great with steel AK magazines, but the over insertion tabs that are in the upper receiver are not. So that's a little bit of a, a limitation. And yes, they did fix this wobble by what they did to the upper, but it is what it is on that one. All right, so let's take a look at putting the upper on. Go ahead and drive these pins out. And what I like about this, with it being an AR type design, is that when you have it all taken apart like I did, it's basically a toolless reassembly. And that definitely works for me. So let's go ahead and stick the upper on. Great. All right, and then inside, I don't know how well you guys are going to be able to see it, probably not very much at all. Uh, but inside, they do have a couple of little over insertion tabs. They are uh, cut from the aluminum upper receiver itself. So again, with steel magazines, that could be a little bit of an issue. If you get some very tight fitting steel magazines, uh, where there's not a lot of play, going to be a lot of rubbing during recoil, it'll probably be okay. But if your steel magazines have a lot of play in the magwell, then that could be a bit of an issue and you could see some wear and tear from that. And while we've got it open, we might as well talk about the, the problem child that I wound up having with this gun. And that was uh, the extractor. You can see the extractor that I got from the bolt from Quiet Riot Firearms because the original extractor broke. And uh, I took this thing out to test it, as I do with all my guns, and I ran it pretty hard like I do with most of my guns. Uh, the first day that I took it out, I ran 390 rounds through it, and it seemed to be doing okay. Had one uh, light strike, and this is a problem that would prove to persist, and that was with the Tula ammunition. You can see the, the little dimple there. And that's not uncommon with Tula with my AKs, because I have some Palmetto State AKs as well. And uh, with my Palmetto State Armory AKs, they usually eat Tula just fine. But my experience with Tula has been that if any round is going to have a light strike problem, it's usually the Tula that does. And that is because the primer is recessed into the rim just ever so slightly more than on most of the other cartridges that are out there. And so in order to hit it, you need a much longer firing pin than a lot of guns come with, especially a lot of Western style guns. There are other kinds of steel case ammunition that are out there. For example, this is a, um, oh, what is this? Do, 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 do. This is Barnall. Uh, Barnall, and you can see that it's, uh, its primer is not nearly as recessed as the, uh, the two ammo. Let me see if I can get them both in the same shot so you can compare them. So yeah, Tula, much more recessed primer uh, than the uh, the Barnall has. So is it a problem with steel case ammunition per se? No. It is a problem with some kinds of steel case ammunition, specifically the Tula. The Tula has primers that are usually just a little bit deeper set than a lot of other uh, kinds of 762 by 39 ammunition and so that can cause light strikes. So first time I took it out, put 390 rounds through it, and one of those were light strikes. So I guess that'd be technically 389 rounds that actually went through it live in one light strike. Uh, but overall, that really didn't surprise me, that didn't worry me. Uh, Tula does the light strike thing from time to time and that's just not a very big deal. Uh, with the other kinds of ammunition that I ran through it though, it seemed to be just fine. Uh, the next day, I decided to come out and do a little bit of accuracy testing. And I was testing with 
this load right here, the Wolf Military Classic 124 grain full metal jacket, which I believe comes out of the Barnall factory. For those people who don't know, Wolf is technically just a distributor, they're not a manufacturer, and so they'll pull from one of the, the main uh, factories that are out there. Uh, it'll be either the Barnall uh, factory, it'll be the uh, Tula factory, or the Vimpel factory most of the time, one of those three usually. Um, and this one, like I said, I think this is a Barnall loading. At least that's the head stamp that's on the cartridge. And the accuracy that I got with it was not anything super spectacular. Uh, fortunately, at the range that I was at, I didn't have a whole lot of room in the winter. My main range shuts down that I can do 100, 200, 300 yard shots. This one, I only had 25 yards to work with, and that's why the groups look pretty good. But it's only at 25 yards, so, you know, kind of have to take that into account. Uh, but if you decided to extend them out to what they would be at 100, this one over here would be about two and three quarters if you extended it out to 100. Uh, the actual size on it was, uh, what was that, 11 sixteenths of an inch uh, for that group right there. And of course, that's only a three shot group. This group over here was like a nine shot group. I'm very, very, very sure that I pulled this bottom one. I'm not so sure about this other one. I'm not sure if that was actually indicative of the gun or if I pulled that one too. It's far enough away from the main group that I think I probably pulled that one, but with that one middle low one um, that was 13 sixteenths of an inch, which at 100 yards would be approximately equivalent to three and a quarter inches. And if you discount that one middle one, and like I said, I know this bottom one was, was me. That, I definitely pulled that one. So if you discount both of the flyers and just go with the, the main group, then at 100 yards, that'd be equivalent to about one and three quarters of an inch. So we're looking at roughly a two to, to three MOA gun with fairly generic, this is not the bottom of the bin in terms of quality. That's usually Tula. Um, but it's pretty close to the bottom of the bin kind of ammunition. And that's more or less what I would expect. Um, we'll have to actually see if that holds true when I get back to the regular range. You can actually, you know, test it and actually add 100 or 200 or 300 and see how it works. But at 25 yards, that's all I had available. That's how it shot. Uh, but getting back to uh, the problem with the bolt. So first time I took it out, put 390 rounds through it. Second day I went out, did a little bit of accuracy testing. However, I had not cleaned it from the previous uh, time. It was literally just the next day I decided to go out and shoot it again. And on the 25th round that day, so 415 rounds total, uh, not counting the light strike the day previous, the extractor broke and of course that pretty much ended that shooting session right there. And I had a very hard time getting a replacement extractor and that's why I wanted to make sure that I thanked Quiet Riot Firearms for getting uh, that new extractor to me. Technically I bought a bolt from them that happened to have the extractor that I needed. but. Uh, I very much so thank them for doing that. I did reach out to Palmetto State Armory to ask them to fix it. Unfortunately, that was a very long, arduous process in which they basically kept trying to avoid fixing it. Uh, I emailed them, uh, what was it, back on January 17th, and they did not get a hold of me, respond to that email, email that initial email until the 26th. And... Uh, they said that they would be willing to send out a shipping label for the complete bolt carrier group, which I didn't like because all I needed was just a new extractor. Um, sending the bolt carrier group away and then waiting for them to do their thing and get it returned was going to be a, a longer process than I really wanted. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, basically a week and a half later, they get a hold of me and say, okay, this is the option. We can do this. Okay, now, how do you want us to proceed? And then in the next email to them, I again reiterated that my preference was for them to just to ship me the extractor because that's all I needed. But I said, if the only way that you can get this thing fixed is for me to send in the BCG, then let's go ahead and do that. Uh, please send me a shipping label at your earliest convenience. Well, they sent me another response email that did not have the shipping label in it. Instead, it was one to say, now we can only really do a return or exchange on the BCG. How do you want us to proceed? 
and I'm sitting there thinking, in the last email I told you how I wanted to proceed. Let me see if I can go ahead and pull that up. Let's see if I can read what I actually said. All right, so the email that I sent to them on the 26th when they uh, find their first response to me, I said, hello, so-and-so, I'm not going to say the person's name because it's not overly relevant, but I said, hello, if you can only get me a new extractor by replacing the BCG, then let's get started on that process. Please send me a shipping label at your earliest convenience. This person's response was, hello, we will only be able to return or exchange the BCG. Please let us know how you would like to continue. Well, on the previous email, I told them how I would like them to continue. Please send me a shipping label at your earliest convenience. And this was a response on the 30th. So nearly two weeks from the time of my original email, and they've kept delaying the fix. So in the meantime, while I was trying to work out things with PSA, I got a hold of Quiet, Fire, uh, Quiet Riot Firearms, ordered a part from them that they turned out not to have in stock, but they got me something that was close enough to work. I'm very thankful to them. They solved the problem that really wasn't even their problem. I mean, being out of stock with what they said they were in stock, that was their problem. But this was to fix something else, and they came through in a much more timely manner. This arrived before uh, the, the last email from Palmetto State Armory. So where am I with Palmetto State Armory on their wonderful uh, warranty that will fix everything? Um, on paper, it's really good, but their customer service department seems to try to drag things out as much as possible, even when you tell them explicitly, okay, send me the label, you've agreed that you can do this, you agree that this is covered under warranty, Ship, uh, send me the label, and they have the audacity to write me again and say, do you really want us to send you that label? Well, now that I've gotten it fixed without your help, no, it's not really a relevant case anymore. But in terms of Palmetto State Armory's warranty being anything to talk about, I'm not convinced. Okay, lots of people online talk about how wonderful their warranty is and how top-notch they are. Uh, I think that they're top-notch with certain people. I don't think that they're top-notch with the average person. And that's exactly what I am. And I am also admit I'm kind of in the doghouse with them. Uh, a while back, I got one of their uh, AKVs, uh, the, their AK and 9mm, and I was not impressed with it at all. And I let everybody know that, and I think I'm still in the doghouse from that because I didn't love uh, their love child as much as they did. And so uh, I think they're just treating me accordingly is what's going on there. So Palmetto State Armory was not much help in getting this thing fixed pretty much at all. But uh, Quiet Riot Firearms, they came through, they got the problem fixed. And so after I got that part, I went out and shot it again uh, the, for the third time. And I put 270 rounds through it. And what's going on? Oops. Well, duh. Put 270 rounds through it the third time, and I did that intentionally. One, just because I didn't have the the uh, the budget to put a bunch of rounds through it. Who does these days? It costs money to replace that. I didn't have a bunch of money to put through it, so that was part of it. But also was when the extractor broke. It broke on this cartridge right here. This is some of the Barnall stuff. And you'll notice that it has some carbon fouling around the casing. Pretty much a, a fairly distinct ring. And what that told me is that the chamber was getting pretty dirty. And with steel case ammunition, the chamber usually does get a little bit dirty, uh, just because steel doesn't expand as much as brass does, and so you'll get some more material that will come back into the chamber area. That's not overly uncommon, but this is quite a bit. This is far more than I have ever seen on an extracted casing uh, before, especially compared to, say, my AKs. Uh, my Palmetto State uh, Armory AKs, they will occasionally get just a little bit of carbon fouling on them, but usually not nearly enough to even talk about uh, or see in any kind of distinct ring unlike that one. Uh, that one had a very clear ring around it. And what that was telling me is that a lot of material was coming back into the chamber area 
And so if I wanted to go through a lot of rounds again, I probably shouldn't do it all in one sitting. I should probably clean the gun in between time. And so that's why I pulled back my round count a little bit. As time goes on, of course, I'll put more rounds through it and we'll see how things progress or don't. Um, but uh, the chamber getting dirty certainly was a contributor to the extractor failure. If the chamber gets dirty enough, you'll wind up with stuck cases. And if you try to extract a stuck case, it doesn't go so well and oftentimes the extractor breaks. And then I got into investigating it a little bit more and also when I was shooting, just taking a look at the ejection pattern, which is normally supposed to be off to your right and a little bit more towards the rear, uh, say somewhere in the 3 to 4.30 kind of position, usually somewhere in that general area with an AR is typical ejection. And this thing was ejecting forward considerably. And you can actually see uh, the, uh, the marks from where the cases were hitting the, the case deflector and bouncing forward. They were coming back with way too much force. And on a 5.56 gun, that normally wouldn't concern me all that much, but 7.62 by 39 is a bit more powerful. And this is only a 10 and a half inch barrel. And a lot of times the shorter barrel versions, if you're gonna have a problem with something being out of spec and over gassed, it's usually with the shorter barrel ones. So after looking at all of that, I said, uh, you know, this might be more than just keeping the chamber clean. Uh, there might be a, a fundamental issue with how the system is set up. So after looking into it a little bit, I got a set of buffers. It already came with an H1 buffer. I also got an H2 and an H3. And the third time that I went out, the time when I put 270 rounds through it, I tested the, the buffers. And the H3 buffer actually seemed to have resolved the issue. And that the ejection pattern was correct. It was about 3.30 to 4.30 where it's supposed to be. And also did not have any new additions to the, uh, the deflector in terms of extra cases hitting it and whatnot. And I could also feel that it was a much gentler re uh, recoil impulse. Now, if you decide to play around with the tuning of an AR, uh, I would recommend a lot of caution just because a lot of times people will do that in the summertime when things are nice and warm and your propellants in your and the bullets themselves and the cartridges typically function better in the summer than they do in the winter time and people get will get things in that one exact sweet spot in the summertime and then when colder weather comes uh, they'll start shooting the gun and it'll start sh st uh, short stroking on them it will start to malfunction you'll have feeding issues and stuff like that and they say well this thing was working perfectly last summer what happened well temperatures dropped the propellants are not as energetic in cold weather as they are in warm weather and so there's not as much force uh, to go against those heavier buffers and you wind up with reliability problems because of that uh, most of the time with a 556 ar i wouldn't mess with it from factory if it was functioning and as long as there wasn't any parts breakage or anything like that that was going on most of the time a factory gun i'm going to leave alone in general, that is not something that I recommend that you mess with. And even with Palmetto State Armory, I generally don't recommend that you mess with anything unless you actually know what you're doing. But in this case, it was so overgassed that it was actually trying to pull the extracted rounds out while you still had some, uh, some significant chamber pressure. And that was what was causing all of the issues. You have increased chamber pressure, you have enough extraction force to finally pull the rounds out, uh, but there's still some pressure there, so you wind up getting some blowback, and that's where the extra carbon was coming from. You're going to get a little bit of extra carbon anyways, but a good AR should be able to go a 1,000 rounds without cleaning. I'm not recommending that you do that. I do fairly destructive testing here. Okay, I, I run my guns a lot harder than most people do, and probably more than most people should, frankly. But an AR should be capable of going a 1,000 rounds without cleaning, even if you are running steel case in it. Okay, it's obviously not as good. There are, is going to be more carbon that gets into the chamber in that case, but it still should be capable of doing it. This was a massive amount of extra carbon, which tells me that there was still a lot of pressure in the chamber that there wasn't supposed to be. And so I needed to hold that system closed for a little bit longer, it's just a fraction of a second, but a little bit longer so that I reduce the stress on the extractor, the thing that broke, and 
make it so that it doesn't come back with quite as much force and as early so that I'm not getting that extra blowback into the chamber. I'm also, you know, not hitting the ejector, which in and of itself isn't a big deal, but it's just an indicator of how forceful or not something is, et cetera, et cetera. And it wound up being the H3 buffer that did that. The one that I got was from Expo Arms. I ordered it through Primary Arms. Primary Arms, the distributor, Expo Arms, the manufacturer. And that seems to have solved the problem. The ejection pattern is correct. Uh, I did take apart uh, the bolt and look at the extractor again, and I didn't see any significant wear on it, at least visually. Time will tell how long that will last or not. But that seems to have been the remedy to the problem. And of course, from here on out, I'm going to not go nearly as long between cleanings. I'll probably, from here on out, keep it at 200 rounds or less between cleanings. Uh, just because I know that the, the chamber issue, the chamber getting dirty, has been an issue in the past, so keep an eye on that. That's also worth pointing out that this cartridge that was the one where the extractor broke on it, that in addition to having that carbon around the ring, that this one has, all of these technically have some kind of a coating on them. Whenever you have a steel cased ammo, uh, they're going to put some kind of a coating on there to, to aid in feeding and cycling and extracting, but this one has a fairly thick coating on it. So you combine that with something that's over gas that's trying to rip those cartridges out before it should, something that the uh, chamber has become fouled up, and something that has a little bit extra thick coating on it. I think all of those combine to create the original problem with the extractor failure. Um, so hopefully putting in that new buffer, that H3 buffer, will give me a lot longer life on the extractor and hopefully solve all of those issues. Right now it seems to be running fine. Time will tell as to just how fine it is, but right now it seems to be doing okay. All right, and then uh, other details while I'm at it. Uh, you may notice that it has a charging handle off on the left side of the gun as you're looking down uh, towards the barrel end. And that I put on there because this gun has no last round bolt hold open. And so you wind up having to run the charging handle every time that you put in a fresh magazine. And doing that from the rear is a little bit of a problem, especially with the recoil spring that Paul Metal State Armory has in this thing. They have an AR-10 spring, a 308 spring in there, and that's, it's a little hard. Not that it's impossible or anything, but it is a little bit tough. And then you'll also see I put an optic on there and getting to the the normal charging handle is a little bit tough. Uh, I do like this uh, side charging system. It is a Devil Dog Concepts hard charger. That's what they call it. And I like it because you can still operate the charging handle in the normal way from the rear if you want to, but you can also just come across the side and grab it, pull back and go. Now, if this was a gun that I planned on using in the field fairly often, I wouldn't want this thing sticking out there, getting caught on gear and whatnot. But given that it's usually going to be used as a bedside gun and only incidentally as an in-the-field gun, I'm okay with that. And this is really easy to take off. It's just a single screw that holds it off. Take it off. Eh, once you remove that screw, it comes off like basically a normal charging handle. And I still have the other charging handle, handle that it came off, that it came with, so I can convert it if I want to. Uh, but it is nice just with the optic on there and with how heavy that recoil spring is. Uh, it just makes things a little bit easier, especially given that it doesn't have a last round bolt hold open. And the last round bolt hold up thing is something that I'm kind of used to. I've been running AKs for a while now. This has basically been my, my venture this year because all the other kinds of ammo just got way too expensive except for 762 by 39 and even it right now is pretty expensive. Uh, but I'm used to not having the last round bolt hold open now so it doesn't really bug me that much. But for some people, it would probably be a deal breaker. But for me, it's it's okay, especially with having that side charging handle to, to hit once I change the mag. It's, it's not too big of a deal. It slows you down, but um, not enough that I would consider it to be worthwhile worrying about. It's going to depend on your application. If you're trying to turn this into a gamer gun, you know, something for competitive shooting purposes and whatnot, last round bolt open is pretty much a must. Um, and if it was something that I was going to be taking into, you know, a prolonged battle, probably not going to be my first choice there either. But as a uh, self-defense gun or a hunting gun, uh, don't really mind it. You know, it's it's not ideal for either of those purposes. But the, the core idea behind this is something that is more powerful 
the gun uh, that I used to travel with, the CZ Scorpion, and it definitely beats that. And something that can be pressed into the other rolls a little bit better. It's not an ideal hunting gun, but it's definitely better than my CZ Scorpion. Um, it is less expensive in terms of ammo costs, at least if you're sticking with steel ammunition. While I'm at it, I might as well go through the kinds of ammunition that I've tested. I've only been able to test four kinds of ammunition because ammo prices are what they are. But as mentioned, I did the Wolf Military Classic 124 grain full metal jacket. I also did the Wolf Military Classic 124 grain soft point, and it didn't have any problems whatsoever with either of these ones. And I was very happy that it ran the soft points well because when you're dealing with a short barrel gun, you don't usually get the full rifle effect out of it when you're dealing with a short barrel one. So having something that'll run soft points well is definitely a plus. I did run the Barnal through it, and this is uh, the round that the extractor broke on. I think it was mostly just a combination of issues that led to that extractor breakage. The fact that the coating that is on these ones is just a little bit thicker than on the other cartridges probably was a contributing factor though, and these tend to be loaded a little bit hotter than a lot of the wolf rounds, which is most of what I put through the gun, and that probably was a little bit of a contributor as well. And then, the one that has produced quite a few problems is this. It's labeled Wolf, that's the distributor. Uh, it's the 122 grain full metal jacket stuff, and this is basically just repackaged Tula. It says right on the head, head stamp that this is Tula manufacturer. Uh, so basically Tula, Barnall, and a couple of uh, kinds of the Wolf Military Classic. And the only ones that had significant problems were the Tula, because uh, the uh, the primers are recessed, recessed into the rims a little bit more than on other cartridges, so you get light primer strikes. And then the Barnal did cause problems, but like I said, I think that was a combination of features. Uh, an overgassed gun that had the wrong weight buffer in it, opening up too quickly, allowing a lot more material into the chamber than there should have been or normally would be, combined with that thicker lacquer coating that's going to push that... Uh, those dimensions inside the, the chamber just a little bit more than maybe they should, combined with a slightly more energetic round, kind of the, the perfect storm of bad combination of features, and that's kind of what did it. Um, I did want to mention on the Devil Dog hard charger that it does not fit as it comes. You need to file down a little piece on the back side here. Uh, that kind of extends and touches uh, the rail. You'll need to file that down, and me, I overfiled it, so I wound up having to shim it with some black duct tape that I just folded into space and uh, kept uh, testing it until I got something that would run uh, properly, just taking off layers of duct tape until I got down to the right thickness. Um, and then, go ahead and make sure it's empty. We'll talk about uh, the trigger a little bit. I'm not a huge fan of this trigger. Okay, so go ahead and take it off safe. A lot of stacking, a little bit of grit. Uh, like a, It's basically a fairly standard AR trigger in terms of weight and length of pull. It comes in on my trigger pull scale at like 5 pounds 11 ounces, 5 pounds... Uh, five pounds, 12 ounces, somewhere in there. So not terribly heavy. The thing that gets me about it though, is the reset. Reset is, it's not unusual for a lot of ARs, but for some reason it gets me. I mean, I'm used to AK triggers that have a fairly long reset on them, but for some reason I just don't get this reset uh, very well. There's lots of times when I'm trying to run it fast and I'll miss the reset and pull back uh, too soon and of course nothing happens and you let it out again and uh, to properly reset and then go again and it's fine, but it for some reason it just doesn't naturally fall into a good place for me. My AKs that have a longer reset um, for some reason are just better for me. Now they also have a lot lighter pull weight and so that might have something to do with it. But for me, it's gonna take getting used to it. And I think that's most of what it is, is just getting used to it. And if you get one of these guns, I would recommend that you stick with something with a fairly standard military pull weight, uh, just because you are using or probably going to be using the Russian ammunition. 
and you want to make sure you have a good solid smack on those primers, especially if you're tr going to try to run Tula in there. Um, just because Tula has the recessed uh, primers and that can be a bit of an issue. Uh, so full weight trigger is okay, but just for some reason I'm not so good on the reset. I am happy to report that it does bump fire quite well. I'm happy about that. That is definitely a plus. Um, definitely better than my AKs do. You can bump fire just about anything. It's just a matter of how convenient it is, how comfortable it is, and whatnot. And this one's light enough and I can choke back on it a lot better than I can with my AKs. The AK grips are usually a little bit further forward and unless you want to burn your hand going through multiple magazines you can't choke back too much but on this one you can choke back pretty well and eventually this does warm up in here uh, but it's not too bad and uh, yeah I bump fires pretty well and I'm very happy with it that way. Uh, in terms of the barrel profile it is definitely a heavy profile barrel even for a 7.62 uh, cartridge uh, so yeah, Palmetto State Armory definitely didn't skimp on that and that also kind of makes me wonder why they went with the buffer weight that they did uh, just because that is a very heavy barrel and people will get that the buffer weights correspond to how over gas the system is or not but what people don't always recognize is that the buffer weight also needs to correspond to the barrel weight that is the heavier the barrel not just how much gas is coming back in the system, but the heavier the barrel, the heavier the buffer is supposed to be. And that's a really, really heavy barrel. It is definitely a heavy profile barrel all the way through. Um, it really should have, in my opinion, a heavier buffer than what it comes with, the H1 buffer that it comes with. If you have the longer one, the, the 16 inch one, you probably can get away with an H2 just fine. Um, and again, it's going to depend on the port size and how things wound up being with your particular gun. If you get the gun and it's fine and it seems to be cycling well and it has a good ejection pattern and whatnot, you know, don't don't mess with something that's not broken. Uh, but if you have one like mine that is overgassed, you're probably going to need at least an H2. In this case, with a short barrel, H3. Um, so I do kind of wonder about that. I'm glad that they have the heavy barrel, but. We should construct the rest of the gun to go with that. All right, but and then on the end they have what is kind of an A2-esque type uh, flash hider, and it, it works okay. Um, you do get a little bit of muzzle bounce when you're you're shooting it. It's not very, it's not super stable compared to some guns. For example, my full size AK with the uh, the fighter break that uh, the AK Operator Union store sells. Uh, I consider to be more stable uh, than this thing. Part of it is that it's a full-size gun with more barrel length sticking out there. That tends to help stabilize it a little bit, but its break does work a little bit better than this one uh, does. But it's not enough for me to really worry about. I'm not actively looking for a new break for it. I'm just saying that it's, I think that they could do a little bit better job with it, but for what it is, I think it's perfectly adequate. So there's all those kinds of details. And then last but certainly not least, I wanted to talk about the optic. The optic is a fairly heavy optic. This thing weighs like about a pound. It is a primary arms uh, Gen 3 3X prism scope. And I've talked about it in the past before I had the gun to put it on. And I like the scope a lot. It is a heavy optic. If I was to take this gun and make it just into a dedicated bedside gun, I would go with a red dot instead just because they're lighter. And the gun by itself is only like a six pound gun. Add this optic on there and now you've got, you know, a seven pound gun. So it definitely does add weight. Uh, but what I like about it is that it gives me capabilities that a red dot wouldn't. I have a pretty bad astigmatism and so red dots have a very limited use for me. I can use them pretty well in close quarters, you know, inside the apartment here. I can use them pretty decently out to 50 yards, at least okay. As I start to go to say 100 yards and definitely by the time that I go to 150 or 200 yards though, uh, my astigmatism starts to really play into things and I just can't use red dots very well. I get kind of the bloom starburst thing going on and a lot of times if I have the the red dot bright enough for me to actually see and pick up, a lot of times it will obscure the target so much that I just can't get accurate shots off. And so if I'm going to shoot at further distances, I need something that doesn't have that blooming starburst kind of effect. 
and that's where prism optics come in. Prism optics are usually better in that regard. Now, depending on the illumination setting, because these ones do have an illumination setting, sometimes with different illumination settings, sometimes I will still get a little bit of a bloom, even though it is a prism optic. Uh, for example, I have uh, the Primary Arms 2X uh, scope on my AK that I have at home for my, my home defense gun. And if I turn uh, the brightness up on that on a fairly high level, like 10 or 11, I will get a little bit of a bloom and that can hurt accuracy as well. Uh, but the bigger problem that I have with that 2X scope is just that the reticle on it is fairly small and so it's just hard to pick out with my eyes being what they are. The 3X though has a very, very, very forgiving uh, size of reticle that is much easier for me to work with. Let's see if I can actually get it in the scope so you guys can see. There we go. You can see a little bit of the reticle in there. I'll go ahead and turn on the illumination so you can see it even better. There we go. Yeah, fairly large reticle, pretty easy to pick out all the details on it, very easy to work with even for my eyes, which is definitely saying something. Now, given that it's 3x magnification, it's not quite ideal for working indoors. And there are ways to deal with magnification indoors, you know, in close quarters environments. But my preference is usually just to close the front cap and use it as basically an occluded eyesight. One eye will see the reticle, the other eye you use to look at the target and you focus on the target and your mind will automatically superimpose the reticle over the target and it's good for quick snapshots. You don't want to focus on the details of the reticle, just basically the ring and you'll be able to pick out uh, the sites well enough to use them at close quarter uh, distances with human sized targets just fine. And when I had this out the first time, uh, 25 yards. I did in fact use that in the daytime and I found that it worked pretty good in the daytime on brighting on uh, the brightness setting 7. Inside I can usually get away with it at uh, level 5 and it worked like a charm. I had some little uh, 5 inch target cubes, little orange uh, cubes that bounce and those kinds of things when you shoot them and had it basically set up like this the brightness level I didn't have as high as I have it right now just because I want you guys to definitely be able to see it. Uh, like I said, I only had it at brightness level and a 7, but at 25 yards away, I could hit those little 5-inch cubes just fine. 5-inch on, on a side course on a diagonal would be more, uh, but no problem whatsoever. So if I can get you know a 5-inch cube at 25 yards, then getting a man-sized target you know at, across the room distances is going to be perfectly doable. The only downside that I've found to this optic so far is that the battery life is just not as long as I would prefer. It's a 3000 hour battery life, which is good at a medium setting. And like I said, indoors, I usually had it at setting five. That's not bad, but I really prefer optics where I only have to change the battery once a year. This one, uh, so far in terms of usage, it's averaging out to somewhere between three and six times a year right now uh, that I'm gonna wind up having to change the battery. And it's a 2032 battery. They're pretty common. They're not super expensive. You know, it's like one or two bucks a piece. It's not all that big of a deal, but it's just inconvenient and I don't like it. Primary arms, if you're listening, coming up with a version of this that has a shake awake feature so that's not always on would really be preferable. You know, you're at least going to double, if not triple, may, <laughs> triple maybe even quadruple your, your battery life on there make it a lot more useful for the, the general person. Right now it is a great plinking optic, uh, decent enough for a hunting optic, depending on what ranges you're using it at. Um, and I feel comfortable using it as an included eyesight. Other people would, other people wouldn't. That's gonna be a matter of preference, but I, I find that that's what works best for me indoors, especially when I don't have my glasses on. I really need to use it as an occluded eyesight because if I don't have the illumination on, Without my glasses on, I can't pick up the reticle. It just turns into a gray smudge. Uh, but if I put that front lens, uh, lens cap on and I have the illumination on, then even with my glasses off, I can pick up the reticle just fine and use it uh, without incident, without problem. I just prefer that it be a shake awake so that I can get a little bit more battery life out of it. And, you know, if you get if you get bored while you're doing the upgrade, making it so that you can uh, turn off the interior part of the reticle for use indoors would be great because the interior part kind of becomes a distraction because you wind up over focusing on it and then 
you, you lose, to, uh, lose time when you do that. So making it, it so that you can turn off uh, what I, I usually call it the Christmas tree, but uh, the chevron with the holdovers and the windage marks, making it so you can turn off that part of the illumination would be great. I still want it to be something to have on so I can use it at range if I need to. But yeah, just in the realms of wishes and things, but overall, very happy with it. I do have to change batteries very, fairly often, but that's the worst thing that I can say about it. Yes, it is a heavy optic, and like I said, if I wanted something that was just for use indoors in a CQB, CQB type environment, I would just go with a normal red dot. But given that I do take this thing outside, and I do, if the need should arrive, be able to use it for hunting, not that it would be ideal for that, be able to use it for hunting if I need to, want something that's a little bit better uh, for that. Um, Anything else to say about it? Uh, one thing I will mention on the optic, it's a 3X optic, and some people say that if you put a magnified optic on what is legally considered a pistol, then that changes the classification. This is something that has actually already gone to court. There was a case in which somebody had basically an AR style gun, and they had a low power variable scope on it and that wound up going to court with the person being accused of having an SBR and this is clearly not a pistol because you intend, clearly intend to use it at greater than pistol ranges so on and so forth. That wound up not holding water in court and the basic reason is this. Putting magnification on a pistol is not at all an unusual thing. There's lots of people who hunt with con uh, more conventional handguns, you might say, uh, like revolvers and those kinds of things, that put magnified optics on their guns pretty frequently. It's not uncommon at all for people who hunt with revolvers. And part of that is to get greater range because pistols actually are capable of shooting plenty far. Um, we just don't usually think of pistols as long range guns, but they can actually go a lot further than most people think. Uh, the day that I was, the last day that I was testing this, the day that I put 270 rounds in it, um, my father was out there shooting his 45 ACP 1911, and he was shooting at the same range that I was shooting this. He was shooting at 50 yards, I was shooting at 50 yards. And he had a little, a little gong target out there that was nine inches, and with the right load, a fairly consistent load, he was using Hordy Critical Defense, not Critical Duty, Critical Defense, it's a little bit lighter load, a little bit more consistent. He was able to nail that thing almost every time, especially by the, the time of our, our session there. Uh, you can hit further uh, targets than you think with a handgun, or at least than some people think you can hit with a handgun. Uh, there's been people that I know that shot at 50 yards, like I said, my, my father with his 1911, and I shot with it too, and we had even open sights, and we were able to do that. If we'd stuck a magnified optic on there, we probably would have been able to go significantly further. There's no particular reason why saying that the magnified optic somehow changes what it is. It still would have been a 1911. For people who use revolvers, they're still revolvers. They are, all, they are still what they are, it's just that the magnification can help you get more range out of it, but another major issue is identification. In some states, uh, for example, you're allowed to hunt deer um, even when it's harder to distinguish between the, uh, the deer. You're able to hunt them at times where uh, the bucks don't necessarily have their full antler uh, growth on them. Instead, you'll be hunting them at times where maybe they just only have the little nubs growing out of their head. And if you're going to successfully differentiate between a buck that has his horns starting to grow again and a doe that doesn't have anything at all, it's nice to have a little bit of magnification, even if they are fairly close, to be able to really zoom, on, zoom in on the head and make sure that this really is a doe or this really is a buck before you take your shot. Okay, that has happened a number of times in those places that allow that kind of hunting. You People will get magnified optics on their guns, even if it's only at 30 yards that they're shooting, just so that they can positively ID that target before they take the shot. Yes, this is definitely a buck. Yes, this is definitely a doe. That is definitely a good thing. So no, putting some kind of magnification on what is legally a pistol does not uh, change it from being a pistol. This has already gone to court and the reasoning behind it has proven to be invalid. The reason why you put magnification on something is to extend your functional range, not the range of the gun. The gun is capable of whatever the gun is capable of. The question is whether or not you can take advantage of it. And putting something on there to make it more able for you doesn't change fundamentally what the gun is. 
And then also, when you put magnification on the gun, what you're doing is you're making it easier to positively ID your target. Say this is the specific kind of thing that I'm going for. In a hunting application, knowing this is definitely a doe or this is definitely a buck is kind of a big deal. And like I said, even at close ranges, if you happen to be doing a, a night hunt or something like that, uh, you might be using you know, infrared or something like that, or lights or whatever, but it's still going to be somewhat hard to determine. Magnification is a good thing. If you're dealing with a lot of undergrowth, being able to identify things is going to be a little bit more difficult, and magnification does significantly help. There is a purpose even on pistols. And like I said, putting magnified optics on pistols has been something that's been done for a long time now. No, it doesn't change the legal status of the gun at all. Uh, perfectly legal and valid to do. This has already gone to court. It's already been decided. It's not a big deal. Um, words of warning as always with any pistol, don't put a vertical uh, grip on the end. That definitely is a problem. And then also make sure that what you have is in fact a brace. It meets the length requirements for braces that are not allowed to be uh, past a certain length of pole. So make sure that you have that covered. And aside from that, you should be good to go. Uh, check your local laws, check the federal laws, of course, but other than that, it should be decent. My overall appraisal of the gun is that I very much like it. Uh, it did come significantly overgassed, and so I had to fix that problem with the H3 buffer. And because it was so overgassed, it wound up breaking the extractor, and so I had to get a new extractor. Thank you, Quiet Riot Firearms, for doing that, and also thank you, Expo Arms by way of Primary Arms, for getting me a buffer that would work with this thing, the H3 buffer. And Primary Arms, I'm very, very, very happy with your 3X Prism Scope. I just really wish that the battery life was a little bit longer. If you could do that, you know, at least double the battery life that it has right now, I would be really, really, really happy. Overall though, good gun, probably gonna take some tweaking, probably wanna have some spare parts on hand, but overall, I'm very happy with it. It shoots well, it's a fun to shoot, um, significantly more powerful than most other things that you're gonna have in the same size category. Uh, this thing is about as powerful in terms of muzzle energy as basically your standard M4. Uh, 5.56 Type AR with a 14 and a half inch barrel. This thing is going to have pretty much the exact same amount of muzzle energy. Uh, but you're shooting relatively inexpensive rounds to get there uh, that are significantly wider diameter. That's pretty cool. Anyways, thank you guys for your time and attention. For those of you who are in Christ, go with God and be blessed. For those of you who are not, I pray that you come to know the true Christ of history. Amen.